Hey, what's going on folks? It's Mike here and welcome to the modern C++ series. In this lesson, we're going to continue talking about the standard template library, talking about the stack data structure. Now the stack data structure is a fundamental data structure. Maybe you've learned it before in a course, but if you haven't, we're going to go over the foundations of it. So with that said, let's go ahead and dive in a CPP reference and we'll learn a little bit about the stack and exactly what it is. It's actually a container adapter data structure. And I'll talk about why that could be a good thing, what it exactly means in the context of C++. So with that said, let's go ahead and take a look at CPP reference here. And again, under the containers library, we will find stack. I'll go ahead and just highlight it here and let's go ahead and investigate. Now, if I zoom in a little bit, let's go ahead and see exactly what a stack is. You'll see that it's in the stack header, easy enough to remember here. And we've got our description here. So the stack class is a container adapter. And again, I'll mention what this idea of adapter means, but we can see something with a container here and some underlying data structure here. So we'll talk about implementation or how you might implement a stack in this video as well. And the important part here, let me zoom out just a little bit, is that this data structure, the stack, specifically is a LIFO data structure, L-I-F-O, which stands for last in, first out data structure. So that's the sort of policy, or if you want to think about it, like a restriction that is placed on how you can access data. The last item in is the first item out. So let me help with this just a little bit so we understand stack, and then we can understand just a little bit of its use cases as well. All right, so here's a stack. And again, it's a last in, first out data structure or LIFO, okay? So that's how you can remember it. And the analogy that folks will often give or that you can think about is if you have a stack of dishes. So let's go ahead and say I put in a plate here. So this will be plate one and i'm going to wash it but then someone comes and adds another plate on top of it plate number two and then plate number three in my sink and then if i go into my kitchen sink well i've got to reach out and grab the first plate and wash that one first so then i wash it and then i reach in and wash the second plate and then maybe somebody comes in and they add a cup on top here which is the fourth item that has been added into our dish at this point. But again, since it's the last thing that was inserted in, it must be the first thing that comes out here. So then I wash that and then I finally finish washing all of my dishes and complete my chores. So that's the idea or the analogy with a stack. It literally is a stack. If you wanna think about it like a stack of books that you have nearby or something of that nature, like for instance, me keeping some of my favorite C++ books nearby, Normally, I would stack one on top here, and then when I remove it, I have the next book under it that I can go ahead and check out. So anyways, that's just the analogy, and I hope that makes enough sense here. And by the way, check out my video on C++ book recommendations, because those are the books from the recommend that I recommend folks read to learn C++. Okay, so now that we have a little bit of an idea about the stack data structure, let's think about some of the operations that we have here. So again, when I am inserting or pushing some plate into my sink here or on top of my bookshelf, I'm essentially putting it on top of my stack here. And usually we call that a push operation. So let's go ahead and label that. So push adds new data, okay? And on the opposite side, instead of pushing, we pop, which removes data from our stack. And we know how it's removing or choosing to remove data because of this policy here or this restriction. So I'm just gonna put a little label here that this is our policy. Or again, if you wanna think about it as a restriction. That the last thing in is the first thing out. So we really don't need to think too much about where things are being inserted. It's either being pushed on the top or removed from the top of our data structure. And if we just want to see what's on top, so if we're looking at our stack of dishes, we have a top operation, which sort of peaks at top element or the last thing inserted. OK, and those are the basic operations of a stack. Okay. So let's go ahead and see what the standard template library gives us. And then we'll play around a little bit with this data structure in order to use it now. After we finish playing with it, I'll also give you a use case of the stack. So make sure that you hang around for that just so we can sort of know why we might want this data structure. But let's go ahead and see how we use it by looking at some of our operations here. Again, as mentioned, we have 
top, which will tell us if we can access the top element, what it is. We might want to know how many things are in our stack, how many dishes to wash, if we have any, so we can check to see if our container is empty. And then we have these operations like push and pop, for instance. And in C++23, we'll get to this when we talk about ranges. We can do some things like push a range of elements at the top. So if you want to put a bunch of dishes at the top, you could do that. We haven't talked about emplacement, which essentially constructs the object. So it doesn't have to be copied and then uh, over to the stack after being uh, created already once. Uh, and we'll have a separate video on emplacement specifically and maybe measuring the performance if folks are interested in that. But I basically want to talk about pop, top, and then some of these other operations here. So let's go ahead and dive into the code here. We'll keep CPP reference uh, open here so we can have a look here. And as noted, I've already included the stack data structure here. So we're going to go ahead and use stack here. And again, looking at the template arguments here, I need a type. So what type of elements am I going to use? Well, let's just start with a integer here. So I'm just going to say my stack here. And then for my stack, I can push on new elements like one. And let's go ahead and print out two and three. And again, this is the order that I'm inserting elements into my stack data structure. Now, one thing that we might want to do here is try to figure out, well, what if I want to print out my stack here? Well, let's go ahead and first just, again, play around with some of the operations here. Let's use top here. And again, just to show you what order is enforced. So let's say top of my stack. And we'll go ahead and print that out. Let's make this a little bit bigger here. There we are. And let's just go ahead and run this code. Now, stack has been around since C++ 98 at least, but I'm going to use C++ 20 here. And it looks like uh, just one little typo. There we are. And let's go ahead and give this a run. And again, we can see the top of our stack is three. The last item in that was inserted is the top of our stack. And this will be the first element that is removed. So let's go ahead and demonstrate that by doing my stack dot pop. And then let's go ahead and look at the top of my stack again. And we should see that the last element there, and we'll make that a little bit bigger here, is two here. So compile, no errors, go ahead and run. And now the top of my stack is two here. Now let's go ahead and look a little bit closer at this pop operation here. Again, just looking at the documentation because well, what happens to that element when we pop it off? Is it just deleted? Well, we have that actual, uh, it is the API here for pop. It, it doesn't return anything. Now, depending on your standard library or languages you've used, or maybe other libraries, it might return something here. So it just removes the top element from the stack. Uh, effectively behind the scenes, it's calling pop back here, uh, but there is no return value. So if I actually want the top element here, uh, you know, to retrieve that value, I actually need to use top here. And let's go ahead and say, you know, hold on to top item. You know, that, that's essentially what I'm doing when I'm saying my stack dot top here. I'm going to copy the value over here so that I have it somewhere before I pop it off here. Okay, so that's the idea. Okay, so I actually have that value here now, too. And why it's sort of designed like this? Again, this is just something that's a little bit of an aside, but you can think about your application programming interface, your API, or what you want to do with your functions is usually it's nice if your function has exactly one job. So in my mind, pop just removes an element. It doesn't remove and return an element. Again, that's the job of top. So you do have to do this in two operations. You could write your own if you wanted to combine these for some reason. Uh, but that's just a little API design thing uh, that sometimes beginners wonder about. All right. So anyways, that's uh, sort of the stack here. Now let's go ahead and uh, just look at some of the other things that we can do here. Let's construct our stack here with one uh, how about negative three, negative two, negative one, just to add a few more uh, values here. And I'm putting them in sort of numerical order here, again, just to make life a little bit easy here. Uh, so let's go ahead and just show that we can uh, try to initialize things here. Oh, let's see what I did wrong here with some errors. And let's try to parse through this message. It's saying Canada expects one argument for provided here. And it's in fact giving me this sort of candidate down here. 
uh, oops, let me remove myself here. So again, Canada expects one argument, four were provided. So it doesn't exactly know how to parse this initializer list. And again, this is because this is a, uh, well, we got to look at the actual container here. And um, let's go ahead and look on CPP reference here. If we try to look at the uh, constructor here, let's see if it has something for an initializer list here. Again, we'll have to look through the different uh, sort of overloads here. We've got the different containers here. Uh, I think I could probably do some other, let's see here. I've got a default constructor with a value, copy constructor, some move constructors here. Um, maybe there's some other ways to do this with say like a range or something that could be interesting, but uh, essentially we've got to, uh, wrap this up here in a parentheses here, and now we can initialize it with multiple entries here. Okay. So that should be the fix here. And now we can initialize my stack here, uh, in our program. Okay. So just a little, uh, fix there, a little gotcha there. If you do want to populate your stack with a bunch of data or have a, uh, you know, a, a stack initialized statically or something. Um, that's just one thing there. Now let's go ahead and print off this stack here. Um, and there's a couple of different ways that we could do it. Uh, the classic way is just to sort of iterate through our stack here. So what I'm going to do is say, while my stack dot empty, and then I'm going to essentially use this pattern here where I grab the top item, uh, from these lines of code. And then I pop off the next item here. Okay, uh, so I'm going to do my stack dot top and I'll just store the results here. And then I'll just pop off my item here. And then let's go ahead and print off the result. Result. So we could see, you know, whatever remains in our stack here. And we'll put a new line here as follows. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and compile this. Uh, now, before I run this, I do want to carefully look at empty here. Um, some APIs, again, will label this as is empty, but let's go ahead and just check out exactly what does empty mean. And empty checks whether the underlying container is empty. Okay. So uh, true if underlying container is empty, false otherwise. So usually we want to say, while well, our container uh, is not empty. Okay. So go ahead and compile this. Go ahead and run it and we can see our results here. So again, the first thing that's being popped off was the last thing inserted here, which was uh, two. Well, from our previous experiment, we popped off three and then we pop off two, pop off one uh, and then zero, negative one, negative two, negative three as shown here. So again, even as we're constructing this stack, again, pay attention to the order of this uh, sequence here. OK, so that is our stack here. Now, sometimes folks will take this sort of function here and if you want to print off a stack, you could write it again in a uh, function here, something like this here. And then what you'd probably want to do here is again, remembering some of the things that we've learned about is pass it by value. So it makes an actual copy of the stack here, depending on if you want to mutate it or not. But if for some reason you were debugging your code and wanted to print off your stack, for instance, to see, hey, what's all the data in here? Uh, that could be something that you could do. So let's just go ahead and use that uh, function uh, just so you can see it in action. Print stack, my stack. And again, uh, let's go ahead and uh, get this run in here. Oops. And I'm just going to call this, uh, I'll rename it my stack here, my stack. There we are just to fix that bug. Uh, okay. There we are. And it should work the same here. Uh, and we might want to use something like uh view stack or something. Again, just think about carefully your names, like print stack, but not modify or something, you know, just to be clear about what this is doing. Okay, now let's get into a little bit of application for why you might want to use a stack here. Uh, well, one of the common things that you might want to do, and I'll go to my drawing board here, and depending on what tools you have uh, in front of you right now, you probably have something that has one of these here. I'll draw a little arrow here and a box, and then maybe another button here that has another arrow that's usually going in this direction. Uh, and this is what we have for undo and redo for instance. So stacks are great data structure. If you can, for instance, push in objects that are some command or action that you do. Action one, 
and then you do action two. And then if I want to sort of reverse what happened, well, I would sort of pop off action number two to get us back in the state where we're, you know, however action one modified our program. I have a video on the design command pattern. If you want to search my name in design command pattern, that explains exactly this pattern here. So undo redo system is somewhere that you'll often use stack here. And you can think about this as your web browser, for instance, sort of moving backwards and forward in your web pages uh, and, and keeping that history. So something that you might do as you pop off items from one stack is you push them into another stack here. So let's go ahead and just sort of illustrate if I push in the numbers one, two, and three, and then I take three and pop it into this stack. Uh, and push pop it off of stack number one and move it into stack number two here, then I am effectively reversing these stacks here and the actions. And I can sort of move back and forth um, like I would in a web browser. Um, and that's just sort of how it works here. And then your web browser will delete your history sort of if you you know navigate to a new page, you can just think about it for a little bit. Uh, and then you could just clear this second stack, for instance. So that's effectively how it works. Uh, and sometimes you balance uh, two stacks. Um, just for fun, if you want to challenge yourself, you can do a reverse uh, stack, which in fact, you would use you could use two stacks for again to push all the elements from one stack into the other uh, and then back to reverse them. Uh, that's kind of a nice uh, programming thing to think about. All right. So before we wrap up this video, though, let me go ahead and talk a little bit about the container adapter here with our stack here uh, and the actual implementation. So part of this template parameter, you'll notice that the default parameter is a deck here with a type here. OK, so this type T should match this uh, class type here. That's just a little note here. But you'll notice that it is a deck data structure. We've talked about this in the STL series. You can find it in the playlist if you need. Uh, but the basic idea is, well, let's think about how we would implement this actual stack here. OK, so let's actually, uh, I mean, one way we could do it is by, again, searching for uh, stack to see how it's implemented in GCC. So of course, you can always do that. Uh, and you'll notice this just includes STL stack. OK, so I mean, what is that? Uh, if you press T and then go to file stl.stack.h, uh, uh, it can kind of look for the implementation here, see if you find something more interesting here. Uh, and again, this will refer to um, what exactly is going on. It says that this is not a true container, but an adapter. It holds another container and provides a wrapper interface to that container. So the wrapper is what enforces strict first in uh, last out order here. OK, uh, and the second uh, template parameter here defines the underlying uh, sequence container. OK, it defaults to deck, but it can be any type that supports back, pushback and pop back. OK, such as list vector or you could define your own data structure here. OK, so you can always, you know, as long as you provide these three functions, essentially back, pushback um, and pop back. So back is a, essentially the top operation pushback is your push and pop back is your pop operation, you could implement a stack. Um, and again, depending on where you are in your computer science journey, you could imagine uh, if you're doing this as an exercise, either using an array or a linked list. OK, and again, in array based implementation, again, we tend to think of like this, you'd allocate some amount of memory, insert some items like one, two, three, four, five. And again, just kind of keep track of this is your uh, first entry. This is your last entry. So your last entry would be the first thing out that you get rid of. OK, and now your last is pointing over here and then you get rid of that and that and so on. And if you continue to allocate stuff, so let's say you add a lot of things here, you would need to you know, reallocate memory here, which is essentially what a vector does. Right. And you'd have your last year or a deck data structure. Now, the deck kind of worked nice because if you remember in that video, it gave us sort of chunks um, of data here. So, for instance, we might have one, two, three, four in this first chunk and then group together with the next chunk of four items that we might use five and six and again have our first and our last element here. OK, so this is sort of like the vector uh, based stack. And this is the deck 
double ended Q based stack. And that's the general idea here. Now, link list, which, which could just be using standard list uh, as the uh, implementation, which again was the uh, doubly connected link list here where you have a bunch of nodes. So as you insert or remove elements here into your stack, one, two, three, right? You have your first or the head of your link list and you have your last or the tail of the link list, which would be the first node that you remove. Okay, so that's a, basically the implementation that you can think about. So let's actually do this. And why you might use different containers here might depend on your operations. So for example, if you're going to do all of your insertions into the stack immediately at the very start of your program, something like a standard vector might be the right thing to do, right? Just one big allocation here, okay? So I can see I'm going to run this. Um, and uh, I need to include the vector data structure. That's the first uh, error here. So we need to actually know what a vector is. There we are. Uh, so again, if you see a huge bunch of errors, don't panic. Just uh, you know, see what we've done here. Uh, and now, well, I need to update my print stack function to also make sure that we're taking in the correct standard vector of int. And now we're good to go here. Okay, so now we're using standard vector here. Now again, just to show you that this runs here, uh, let's go ahead and, you know, show you with list. Make sure I include list here uh, before I make any more mistakes here. I think I get it in all the spots here. And again, that's the idea here. So again, if you're maybe frequently sometimes or every once in a while adding and, and popping, you know, elements very sparsely, maybe you want to use a list. So that's why you have this flexibility to change what the underlying structure might be. Uh, and it's sort of for the performance that you might think about. Again, the program runs just the same. It's just that you're adapting the underlying implementation. The stack data structure itself, all it's doing is enforcing that you can push stuff, pop stuff, and look at the top, essentially. Those are your operations, uh, as well as a few of the other things like checking if it's empty or the size. Okay, so that's the basic idea. That's a container adapter. You have a few of them in C++. We'll get to those in the videos uh, that follow this. So make sure you subscribe so you don't miss those. And as always, if you want, you can follow along by signing up at courses.mshot.io to see or track your progress on C++. Again, it's free to just enroll here. You'll see the same videos here uh, with the notes. It's just sometimes nice to see which lessons you have uh, watched and completed. All right, folks, so I hope you found that as a useful video talking about the stack data structure, some of its implementation, how it works, how some of the operations work, uh, and some practical use cases like using an undo and redo system. And I highly recommend you'd watch my uh, design pattern video on the command design pattern, which would talk about how you might wrap up your custom objects as actions so you can undo uh, and redo things. It's a really cool pattern, and I think it's uh, very useful and very pragmatic. Anyways, folks, thanks for your time and attention, and we'll see you in the next one.